Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to another Eurocontrol Aviation Straight Talk Live, the program where we talk to industry leaders in aviation to talk about what's going on, what isn't going on, how we build back better, and indeed what that better might look like. As you know, we've been talking to people from uh, long-haul destinations and long-haul services recently, but today I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Jan Lundrum, who's the CEO of EasyJet, the largest airline in the United Kingdom and one of the largest airlines in Europe, and of course, very much a short haul airline. But as ever on Straight Talk, first we go and ask the Director General of Eurocontrol, Mr. Eamon Brennan, if he'd be so kind as to tell us what's going on in the market at the moment. Eamon. Good afternoon from Brussels. First of all, I'd like to welcome Johan Lundgren, CEO of EasyJet. It's a privilege and an honour to have you, Johan. So I'm looking forward to a really good Straight Talk Live with Andrew. It's also uh, important, I want to welcome you to week one of year two of our first ever pandemic. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of things been happening over the last number of weeks. The big vaccination race in Europe continues, and it's a little bit like Cheltenham races. Israel and our, of our member states, United Kingdom, are well ahead, and the rest of us are lagging, unfortunately, a little bit behind. So we've a lot of work to do on rolling out vaccines in Europe, and it's a very difficult task. And hopefully over the weeks ahead, we'll make more progress, because really, it's the only way out. Since we spoke last, the EC have come up with the concept of a vaccine certificate. And this is something that I really welcome, because it will facilitate travel during the summer. I know it's not to everybody's taste with GDPR issues, etc. But we do need some way of showing that somebody's had a vaccine that will be recognised from one state to another. You know, on the first anniversary of the pandemic, and remember, we're in week one of year two, we just need to look back and figure that traffic has dropped by 60% in just seven days to start off, really to a very low ebb. And you know, when you look, for instance, right up one year later, you can see that you are in a similar, very difficult situation. We have never recovered the ground that we've lost. We're 65% down on 2019, but we will recover. For the first time with the vaccines, we can see some light at the end of the tunnel. Even though some states are in a wave three and a wave four, it is the best way out. And I think the summer season will bring us renewed hope in aviation. You know, when we look at the top six airline groups and how it's affected them, and here we're measuring flights per day, you can see that last April things shrunk down. And let's see if this is what's going to happen this year. We had a quite a good summer last year. You know, we recovered to about 40, 45 percent of the levels before, before shrinking right back to a very low ebb in March 2021. And talking about low ebbs, let's have a look at yesterday. Yesterday, compared to 2019, low-cost travellers, 87% down. That includes EasyJet, traditional 70%, business aviation. In fact, if we're really honest, all that's flying in Europe at the moment is cargo operations and internal operations in the United Kingdom, in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, in Norway. That's actually really where it is at the moment. So it is a difficult situation. And you know, EasyJet... If you just look at the um, progress they've made, they've went from being the second largest airline in Europe in 2019 to in the last seven days having a 92% reduction on their 2019 figures. And for Johan, I'm sure this is a big shock also. So you can see that even in the last seven days, they're reduced further. And just to give you a kind of a metric to look at, on the same week last in 2019, they were operating 1,700 flights a day. Remember, March, it's not top season. This year, 231 flights per, per day. So I wish the best of luck to Johan and to Andrew. I'm really looking forward to a lively debate. Thank you to all the listeners for tuning in to Eurocontrol Straight Talk Live. We're doing our best to help everybody, and I know that aviation will recover. So hang in there till the summer. We're going to get out of this. Johan. Welcome to Straight Talk. Great to have you with us. Although those figures from uh, from Eamon weren't all that great, were they? 
No, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, starting when you look at it as well. But, you know, clearly we are all too familiar with it. We, we only, you know, guided to not fly more than 10% in the quarter that we are in. So and that is what those uh, figures are demonstrating, very sadly. Yeah, indeed. So Eamon said there is light at the end of the tunnel. Do you think there's light at the end of the tunnel? Oh, absolutely, there is. Uh, and, and the key to the whole thing is really about the vaccination. And, and uh, you know, all of it uh, that you got to recognize that, you know, certain countries are more advanced in this than, than others. The trajectory is is the same. So there's no doubt that that the 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 key to unlocking, you know, the, the travel and unwinding the restrictions that are in place is down to a successful rollout of the vaccination. And the sooner and the quicker and more efficient we can see that happens, the sooner we can start operating again. Yeah, we seem to be in a race, don't we, between the vaccines and the variants. So I guess getting vaccines rolled out more quickly will, of course, give the variants less time to regroup and uh, come back again. Do you think that the vaccine certificate that Eamon also talked about will be a helpful component of that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it, it is part of, of the, the mix. But, you know, we, we've said all along, and I think that was very good when we now saw the, the commission coming out with their with their um, digital green certificate in there that the vaccination shouldn't be mandated for, for people to travel. There are different ways you can look at that. If you have statistics and data that shows that, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, the virus is in control in certain jurisdictions, you should be able to allow, you know, travel to take place with as few restrictions as, as possible. So it doesn't discriminate the, the people from that point of view, but it's definitely a, a helpful, you know, contributor as we're looking to see now, you know, the, the unwinding of the restrictions that are in place. Right. Do you, do you think that the vaccine, sorry, the vaccine certificate will create, hopefully, what, a single Europe with one exterior wall? Is that what you're seeing? Or do you think it actually allows us to reopen international aviation as well? Well, I mean, the great thing about the vaccination is the, the, the positive impact it has on hospitalization numbers and, and deaths. So it's almost delinking the, the, the cases of COVID to actually the hospitalization and, and the deaths. And that's really, I think, one of, one of the core things be, you know, behind the approaches that I think most governments are now taking, that they do accept that there will you know, most likely uh, be cases around for some time. That's not the question, and that's what what I do think is a good thing about having a a, a, a non-zero COVID approach to this, because it means that you have to live with that, and you can do that in a safe way. And then, of course, also with the with the um, improved testing that it now is starting to come through in terms of detecting the variants, and at the same time be able to also work out if the current vaccinations are also effective on on those variants. That's really, really the key thing. But right. you, take, you take UK as an example who, who removed Portugal from the red list, uh, but there's still cases of, of the variants in Portugal. And, and that means that, you know, uh, and it proves the, the sensible things about the fact that if you have protected the most vulnerable and, and the elderly, it actually delinks, you know, the, the, the cases from the hospitalization and the deaths. So you're not in favour of red lists and green lists and travel bubbles and things like that? No, I, I do think that there needs to be in place as we are opening up Europe for travel again. There's no doubt that, that there, there will be a, a, a time where there needs to be a, a framework, a risk-based uh, framework, when we can unwind these restrictions. The whole point about having the, you know, the travel, you know, uh, the traffic light system, if you're looking at it from a green, an amber and a red, is to make sure that you can, you know, start at some point and then gradually, as more and more countries get control of the processes, make sure that you can start flying again and travel again with no restrictions in place. This, this, right. is, this is the important thing. We got to remember that the, the objective is here to come with a framework that can work and handle things that we're seeing that there might be, you know, jurisdictions who will see increasing cases of, of certain things where you can go from being in one, you know, part of the traffic light system to a different part of it. But ultimately, as countries get control and manage the, the, the infection, that we can resume travel with no restrictions in place. That's one of the fears 
that that I have, and I and I I, I speak to that with decision makers as often as I can to remind them. And I think that is everybody understands that we need to get back to a place where we safely can travel and fly again with no restrictions in place. Okay, so let's let's talk about that happy place. A nice a nice thing to to think about. How do you see the recovery happening? Leave the vaccination issue aside, although obviously taken as a given. How do you see the recovery happening? Well, I, I think you, you can't, you know, separate the, the successful rollout of the vaccination program for, from the recovery. I, I think that I, I always said that I thought that th this crisis consisted of different phases. You have a survival phase for the industry, then you have a recovery phase, and then you get back into a growth phase. And we can debate about where one phase ends and another phase picks up. But I think that the vaccination and the successful rollout of the vaccination is absolutely key to, to make sure that you can accelerate through the, these different phases. That, that is the thing that is different now from where we were, you know, well, go a year ago or, or even mm -hmm. six months ago as well. And like I said, even if you're seeing that this is taking place at different speeds in, in different countries, and now unfortunately we do see some countries who has an increased risk of infection, the trajectory is, is the same. The more you can successfully roll this out, the, the easier and the faster you can remove the restrictions because it will be safe to do so. So you're not worried about the third wave in France, the fourth wave in Italy, things like that? No, I, I think one should always be, you know, very mindful and, 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 and be concerned about it, not least first and foremost because of the public health issue and the people are mm -hmm. suffering as a consequence of that. But, but I never thought that this was going to be a straight line where we would just see, you know, recovery happening and, and there wouldn't be any, you know, uh, bumps along the way. Uh, but like I said, what is important is actually to see where is this going? Well, the trajectory is clear. You take UK as an example. Um, you know, less than two months ago, I, you know, UK was peaking when it came to, to, to the amount of deaths and the hospitalization rates. Um, and at that time, I think there were eight, nine percentage of the population who was vaccinated. Now, um, you know, half of the adult population has has received the first shot on this and, and hospitalization numbers and deaths has, has fallen significantly and dramatically. And of course, now everybody's doing it their absolute utmost in, in, in Europe and every country is doing what they can to roll this out in, in a successful way. And then the same thing will happen also there. So then turning more directly to EasyJet itself, have you, are you now in position? Have you got, are you having to hold back your staff and your airline from bursting back into life? Well, I mean, we, uh, I, I can tell you that, you know, we, we can't wait to start flying again. I mean, right. the, the, the organization is just ready to go and we kept the fleet in flight ready conditions and, and the people trained to be able to ramp up as we see the, the, it allows us to operate. It's not about the uh, demand issue. The underlying demand is there for people wanting to visit friends and family. Holidays and leisure is on, you know, top priority for people, but also business travel. We see that through, through discussions we're having with, with companies that uh, the whole idea of the fact that, well, you know, business travel is not going to recover from this because they're going to work and, and uh, conduct business in the way we're doing right now, that, that's just not correct. You know, uh, you know, business travel and doing business is very much a relationship building thing and a, and a social thing, and that will happen as well. Probably will take a little bit longer than, than what you will see from a holiday's point of view, but this will happen and it will take place. Do you see it happening from our perspective first within Europe itself though before it sort of moves outside of Europe? Well I, th I think it's difficult to to say I, I think it comes back into you know the the rate and the success of the rollout of the vaccination program and then also within what jurisdictions you can allow them travel to to take place but even so even if you're flying in and to a country where you have higher rates of infections as long as those infections are known, you know, speaking about, you know, the variants of, of concern, that shouldn't prompt a big problem if you're elderly and most vulnerable and a majority of your population is vaccinated. And, and that's right. what I think is the key thing. You, you have to live with this virus. And that's why I think that that approach of a non-zero COVID approach is reasonable, which, which I do think that governments are taking in general. Right. So you're putting yourself completely opposed to most of the Asian countries, of course, who have very much taken a zero COVID approach, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, China. 
Yeah, well, the, the param parameters and the characteristics of, of, of the countries are very, very different. Mm. And I don't think that there is anybody who argues that, that uh, you know, locking, essentially, if you're taking a zero approach to this, you need to shut the borders. Yeah, well, that's I mean, what I'm sort of trying to get to. Do you, do yeah. you see long haul international travelers being much slower to recover? Yeah, but but even that that point to, to say that you know you can shut this down, but you know in 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 the mid term to long term that is not a sustainable solution at all. It no. doesn't work that way. The society isn't set up that way, and and that's certainly not uh, you know I I think a, a reasonable approach. So the the EasyJet recovery process, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, is almost going to be modular. As a place sort of opens up, you'll be putting on services. You've got a big base in Geneva, in Switzerland. You've got a big base in Vienna. Do you do you think you'll keep those bases and, and then open them as the opportunity allows? Yeah, so, so I think you're referring to the AUCs that we have. So, well, so indeed, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we consider ourselves very much a European airline. And, you know, and with the AUCs that we have both in Switzerland and in Austria, that, that sets us, you know, being presence in, in Europe in the way we want to do. And also to be able to cope with some of the challenges around the Brexit, as, as you would know, and mm -hmm. the ownership requirements that, that, uh, that we also have found solutions on that we worked with for a long time. Um, but but I, coming back to, to your point about, you know, it, it, will the recovery be in kind of a moderate way for us? You know, we, we took the view a year from now, a year from now that we said you know in contrast to some some airlines that look we don't know for how long this is going to last therefore we need to make sure that we have enough cash and liquidity to to sustain and and and, and you know manage through this this initial phase of of, of this crisis uh, we also made sure that we did essentially, you know, big restructuring programs in, in the company to reduce the cost base, partly to manage the ongoing cash burn, but also to set ourselves up to make sure that when we come out of this, we come out of this in an even more competitive way from a cost base point of view, because that will in itself also help us in the recovery phase where we want to grow. So we always kept an eye out also for the recovery and how can we come out in a leading way on this. We have done a number of initiatives, you know, that actually has made us a better airline, believe it or not, throughout this period. The customer's ability to sell service when it comes to managing cancellations and, and, and rebookings uh, is one example of that. Um, we have since before set up EasyDebt Holidays, who is in prime position to take advantage of the recovery we're going to see in, in holidays. We did that in, in 19. Um, and then also in 19, as you know, we were the first major airline in the world to offset all the carbon emissions from the fuel we're using. And if it's one thing, one thing that's going to be different coming out of this crisis compared to other crises we've been into is a much more focus on sustainability. And I think that, you know, with the position we've taken on that, we are positioning ourselves well to also then uh, embark on, on that journey and that next phase. I'm going to ask you a number of questions about sustainability in a minute, but you will. Be, before, <laughs> there's a shock. But before we get to that, you also mentioned the fact that you've been looking at your cash position, you've been trying to become more competitive versus some of your competitors, most of whom, not all, but most of whom received huge amounts of money from their governments, whereas EasyJet has been very much at the back of that queue. Does that upset you? Does that bother you? No, it, it doesn't bother me that that airlines receives money from the government i always thought that this crisis was way beyond what you could expect you know the the industry as a whole to cope to cope with so so that's not what 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 i'm concerned about but what i'm concerned about is the amounts the different levels of amounts that has been given into you know airlines in in equity in 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 cash in that example and if that money is not there purely to survive, but actually take, you know, uh, advantages, you know, to gain market share or to do investments, which they normally wouldn't be able to do. Well, that distorts competition. And that will then fundamentally hurt the, the players who was, you know, strong coming into this and who's been operating conservatively fiscally for a number of, uh, of years. So it is that the distortion of the amounts that's come into the system that I have more concern about. Look, to, to any extent, you know, all airlines in Europe have benefited from some type of, of support, mostly through the furlough schemes that, that is now. Yeah. But it's a massive difference to a, 
to a scheme that is available for a number of other industries compared to the billions and billions and billions that's been pumped in and injected into to some legacy airlines as part of you know equity as an example and if that money is being used in a way that you're trying to you know take get competitive advantage that's not fair and we're going to be very you know concerned and and, and stay and monitor that situation very closely so how do we level the playing field given that we've had this very uneven gifting of money how do we make that playing field level do we just have to leave that to the market well it's if, first of all it's not completely new is it no well <laughs> indeed it is <laughs> i mean let's not go in to mention certain airlines here but yeah, there are a number of airlines who's been favored one way or the other by, by their governments you know in in previous times as well and we've been equally as concerned about that as as we are with, with what's happening now uh, so, you know, it is about making sure that, you know, we stay close to it. Do you make decision, uh, you know, uh, makers aware of it? And and um, and if that needs be, you bring it, need to bring it forward to a case if it is, the, you know, to that point that unfair. But ultimately, you would want the market to regulate itself that much because it, it has the benefits that, you know, uh, being prudent and being successful and being strong pays off in the long run. That's the way mm -hmm. it should be. Then so on the other hand, on the other hand, let, let me also say that, you know, uh, uh, competing against, um, you know, uh, weak legacy carriers is, is, uh, is not a bad competition either. <laughs> <laughs> and arguably the state aid doesn't make them any stronger. So how do you, where do you see, Ryan, uh, sorry, well, that was Freudian, wasn't it? Where do you see <laughs> EasyJet um, five years from now? No, look, I mentioned a couple of things already. You know, we came into this in, in one of the strongest airlines that, that is in there. We managed ourselves through the situation in a prudent, in a conservative way. So we always set ourselves up. We want to come out of this in a leading way. We have reset the cost base. We've got a number of initiatives on the revenue side that we know is going to pay it off. We have also invested into digitalization, you know, putting and empowering the customer even more to it. We got a position in sustainability with the offsetting that we're doing and also the work we're doing around uh, uh, zero uh, emissions aviations, whether that is electric and hydrogen. Uh, I think we nobody does more in that area than, than, than we do. And we got easy that holidays that we launch is going to be in prime position to really take off when we know that there's going to be a search here for people to come and, and, and want to go on holiday. That together with being at the leading airports in Europe, where the big encashment areas is, puts us in a, in a in a prime position to take this onwards and, and lead as we go through this but, recovery. But it does it does lead me to ask that other great gift that that some of the airlines, including perhaps you, have received in, as part of this recovery, which is the the relaxation of the slots regime. Can you see the argument of Ryanair and of Wiz and what have you that this is just cementing the legacy carriers, which perhaps includes you in those cases? Absolutely not. It's nonsense. It's don't hold back. Don't hold nonsense. back, young boy. What well, do you think? Can, you, can, can somebody demonstrate to me one time where their argument is right that this puts competition at risk? We're handing back our slots. They can fly as much as they want. So this is just nonsense. Well, you, they can fly as much as they want now, but then, of course, you get to reassume well, those slots. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure the other airlines will fly, you know, all of them then at that time as well. Do you think it's nonsense. Do you think do you think 10 years from now the European aviation industry will look like it did two years ago? I think um, you're going to see first of all I think it's going to be you know much more focused on how you transition yourself into a uh, uh, to uh, you know a, a more of a sustainable and environmental friendly industry by that point of view. I think clearly digitalization is going to matter more. I think you're going to see a much more convenient and seamless way of of how you are engaging with the customers. That's that's going to uh, play a role. But sustainability will will be the key thing. Um, I'm not so sure um, that there will be. You know, I uh, know the majority of commentators says, well, there will be consolidation and there will be fewer play, players. Um, I'm not so sure that that will be the case. You, mm. you can logically argue that that is the case, but because of what we already touched upon, you and I, that you know, there, you know, the geographical composure of, of Europe is such that you see a number of governments and 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 that has natural interest in keeping some of these airlines alive. They probably should have gone out of business a long time ago. That it is most likely to remain. Yeah. So you know, um, I think that it, it's it's not necessarily that the you know competitive landscape is going to be that much different. But if you if you're strong going into this, 
and you played your cards well, you're going to come out of this in a stronger place. If you were weak coming into this and you're taking on huge amount of debts where the history shows that your ability to repay those debts isn't obvious, well, then, then it puts a question mark on, on, on some of these airlines. Right. Um, the other thing you've just said that I think is really fascinating is that you think sustainability will become a competitive point. Did I hear that right? Yes, it, it, it's, uh, I, I hesitate when I say yes, but it's absolutely true, it, it will. We know from own service that people who are aware about our carbon offsetting program is much more likely to choose us uh, again versus other airlines. And we can also see that their satisfaction with the experience is greater and higher when they are aware about the program. Now, the reason why I say, you know, we didn't do this because we thought, okay, this is going to be a competitive advantage. This was something that we were convinced about that this is part of how we're going to operate. And remember that the, the carbon offsetting, it is an interim solution before you get on to really groundbreaking technologies. But one mm -hmm. of, the, one of the things with this is, is that with the right quality project, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It either right. avoids uh, carbon avoidance emissions happening or it removes it from the air. So this is one of the best things you can do at this moment in time. And I don't think that there's a country or, or a company for that matter who are, are in, in ambition this area who doesn't look for offsetting in one piece of the equation, but it's only one piece. And of course, we would like to get on to you know, zero uh, emissions aircraft as soon as possible, and that will happen. But until then, this is the right way to go. Before the crisis, you, EasyJet was very heavily into, or had certainly uh, more than any other airline, pushed into the electric aeroplane sort of front. You've been pushing for Airbus, your main supplier, to, to build them. It, hydrogen, electricity, sustainable fuels, what do you think is the, is the way we're going to go forward? Or a combination of all this. Look, I, I think to start with, with the latter, I think sustainable aviation fuels and, and particularly the power to liquid one, they can play a role for long haul. That is definitely not something that, you know, we as a short haul operator would look at to be a, as part of our end game at all, because then it's much better to go into, you know, the electric and, and the hydrogen solution or a combination of those. And I think if, if for all the bad things that happened in 2020, one of the most encouraging things was also that the technological advances in this field was, was quite, you know, remarkable. You know, if you're looking at the, the performances of the new uh, uh, lithium sulfur batteries, as an example, when you're looking at the, the hydrogen technology and how you can use that with, you know, with powering fuel cells or even, you know, normally internal combustion engines, as an example, um, or a combination of these things. There's no doubt now that, that it, it's a matter of time when you're going to see large scale you know, 150, 180 seaters be operating and flying into this. The, so the, the question isn't the challenge around this, you know, from a technical point of view. The question is, how do we transition to that? What's the business model going to look like? And that's so how, do we, how do we transition to that? What is the business model going to look like? Well, what you need to do is to make sure, first of all, that you have the performance uh, of the equipment you're going to use, and you're going to make sure that that is also readily available. You need to make sure that you have renewable energy to support, you know, the equipment you're also then going to use. You need to make sure that once you can operate with one aircraft, you know, how do you make sure that you mm -hmm. face out your kerosene, you know, fleet into, in, in, into the, the new equipment? And that's, you know, ongoing discussions and, and work that we are starting to think about how, how this will take place. Um, so, but this is all, you know, superbly, you know, exciting things to do. You know, when I was speaking about this, you know, two, three years ago, I still had critics who, who said, well, it's never going to happen. Now it's, nobody says that. The question is more about when it's going to happen. And, and that will be a result. It's not without challenges at all. This represents a number of challenges, but also opportunities for, for the company who will do this right. So sustainable aviation fuels, you know, in the best form, I think it's absolutely the right thing for the long haul. For the short haul, you much rather go into the hydrogen and the, the electric environment. And also as a bridge then, much better to offset the carbon emissions that you're doing today and take the cost to do that. That's much better for the environment than putting in, you know, huge development costs for sustainable aviation fuels that actually will be obsolete if you're a short haul operator here in 10 to 15 to years time. So how do we fund this development? This is going to cost a lot of money, isn't it? I mean, is the solution 
or is part of the solution mix something like a tax on fuel or a, a departure tax or something like that, an environmental tax? Well, first of all, there are, there are plenty of, of taxes who's been called sustainability taxes and green taxes, and actually none of them has gone in to do anything of the, of the things that we're describing and would like to see. Look, one thing to bear in mind, and I'd like to point that out, this is not, this is not only something that we're going to think about, well, you know, how is this going to be funded? This represents also a huge, massive industry in itself. Mm. This mm. is also a, a great opportunity for for Europe or, or for UK or for anyone to take a leading position in something that's just going to take this to a completely different level in a, in a completely different way going forward. So I think that that's one of the incentives that should really be in, in place there. Uh, but, you know, one of the concerns is clearly that as we're going through this situation we've been into and, and all airlines have taken on debt and, and it will be you know, a difficult period of time as you go forward through the recovery, which will happen, to say that, look, how much money can you now afford and invest into these new technologies if you're living with, with the consequences of the pandemic and what is, what is hurt and what is damaged you? That's why we need government support. That's why we need government funding. To, to to be working on those projects and and there are there are those examples taking place but i think we need to see much more particularly around the hydrogen and and to the electric at the moment the commission seems to be taking a a slightly different tack uh it's proposing for example eliminating short haul flights that's obviously something that's pretty personal to to you at easyjet isn't it but 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 here's the point you're going to limit short haul travel to re be replaced by what? The, well, by the, trains. The, well, the, the, the train network isn't ex extended as you might think. And to put in extraordinary, you know, uh, um, energy, uh, carbon emissions projects now to get this going, and it's going to pay you off in 15, 20 years time when we already have this, these new technologies. That's just not the solution. That makes it worse for the environment worse for the environment when we needed the least. And by that time, we will have different technologies coming our way as a short haul airline. I think what the government needs to do, what decision making needs to do is to incentivize those companies who are taking the actions and going in and investing in those technologies that are available, like the carbon offsetting as example. And you know, mm -hmm. if you are offsetting as the highest quality projects that is out there, that's what you should incentivize uh, companies to do. And at the same time, but then also make sure the investments are there in place to support also ourselves coming into zero emissions and uh, aircraft, as an example. Right. Well, OK, thank you. The, two more things I want to talk about. The, one is there's been a push recently from a number of your competitors to put in a minimum price for ticketing. Uh, would you be in favour of that? No, I, I you know, it, <laughs> I, I, I can see why some would like to see that, because that also puts, you know, distorts the, the competition. Look, you asking me that question, who works and privileged work for a company who took as its mission to democratize travel. The, the, the pure objective of why this airline was set up is, was to allow millions and millions of hardworking families and students and people who weren't rich, who weren't wealthy to be able to enjoy this product and service. So by now setting a minimum price where you actually once again are going to drive higher social inequalities, making sure once again that you turn the clock back to 1995 or before the deregulation where only the wealthy and the few were allowed to fly. That's, that, that is an awful proposition in every way you look at that. Well, I no. thought I'd ask because if you said yes, I thought, well, there's a headline right there. Oh, yeah, well, you, you, you wouldn't be surprised by that. Look, but this is the company. This has been the company's mission. This has been the thing that, you know, what got me so attracted to this company was that it was, you know, giving out the product and the services to the many people. And it did it in a way compared to some other low-cost carriers. We actually thought that the experience was great and, and digitally advanced in every aspect you look at that. And of course, having attractive fares and bring great value for money, which we do. We ranked as number one when it comes to value for money in a number of our markets. That's something we're immensely proud about. Right. And you, you've touched on a number of times data. E EasyJet has also been right at the forefront of analysing and being very analytical in what it does. Do you see that continuing? 
Yeah, absolutely. And 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 you know, we we we're using uh, when we have you know billions of data points you know that is available, and you know with the framework of GDPR, you know you you can do number of things to get you know uh, engage with the customers in, in in a greater way, and also be much more efficient reducing costs and looking at the initiative also to improve your revenues by being smarter with your pricing and more fair with your pricing as an example. And, and this is a, you know, a fantastic asset that, that this industry has. And I just think it's been underutilized also in a number of companies, but you're gonna do it in a, in a safe and responsible way, clearly. So do you, how do you, a lot of people talk about digitization almost as being a process point you know that you will be you you will check in by having your eye scanned you won't need to touch anything those sorts of issues you're looking at it much more in an analytical sense aren't you yeah yeah so 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 digitalization is a different thing than than you know using the data you know you know Avon's you know, you know depressing slide when they showed that we were only flying what eight percent here in the last week or something mm -hmm. of the capacity that is driven very much by data because we've said all along that we only wanted to do you know, flying that is generating a positive contribution to the company. So we've been using a lot of data models to work out, you know, what those routes should be. So it's primarily domestic route network that we have, and we have some, you know, routes also in, in, in other markets that are doing well for us. And we know that when we're looking at competitors in, in certain ways, how they fly and what they fly, they're losing money by doing so. But we're using data very much as an as an as, as a way to make sure that we're managing also the cash flow throughout the situation. That's one thing of use, using data. Then you have the digitalization, kind of the language on how you can you know apply the data in a way that it becomes you know a, a better experience also for the customer. And that's where I think it will be important also as we go through this next phase to make sure that this continues to be a convenient and seamless approach for the customers. One of the concerns I would have is, as I mentioned earlier, is that restrictions are that are in place right now lingers on because people are just generally afraid to remove them without having any you know, support from a, from a logical or scientific approach that they should be around. We got to make sure that travel and flying will become once again as seamless and as convenient and as easy as it was before the pandemic. And digitalization is a great way of doing that. Which is a perfect segue for my final question, which is what do you think Eurocontrol can do as part of that process to improve aviation in Europe and aviation globally? improve the efficiency at the air traffic control system. And I know, I mean, Eamon and the team and the organization are, are, are doing a lot of work on this, and it's a so important thing to do, at least from a sustainability point of view. I mean, we could also significantly reduce the impact on the environment if we got ourselves through the single European skies or the equivalent projects that, that is now taking place there as well. And I think it's really an urge to decision makers now to get going on this and with the support of Eamon and the team, you know, that is something that can have a, you know, significant, you know, positive effect on the environment. And then also to run it more efficiently to make sure that, you know, the costs are, are lower and we get better value for the money and for the services that we are paying. That's a, a target for us all, I think, and a, and a wonderful roundup back to low-cost carriers as a general comment, and EasyJet in particular. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found that as interesting as I did. I know that I learned a lot, and I just want to thank uh, Johan on your behalf and indeed on my own for his time today. I think that was a really fascinating conversation. We only touched on a number of the subjects that, that I'd love to have gone into more depth. So it's my pleasure to tell you that one of those subjects, of course, is the new technology. And our next speaker is on the 30th of March, 1400 on Tuesday, the 30th of March, where we'll be talking to Mr. Guillaume Fev, who is the CEO of Airbus. And of course, EasyJet is an enormous Airbus customer. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you again, Johan. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you, to thank you all and to wish you all a very good day.